done with the endocrine system for now, and we will cover more hormones, but I tend to cover them as we go over the relevant system. So things like angiotensin, or things like thymosin, or the gastrointestinal hormones, I'll cover them more as we go throughout the different systems in the body. But now we're on the cardiovascular system. And does the cardiovascular system look like this? No, it's kind of like just showing you a schematic. But what is the cardiovascular system? So it definitely includes the heart. That's the cardio part over here. And the vascular system. Now, do not. Th this is not anatomically correct. But it's just showing you the what they call the two circuits in terms of the blood vessels. So blood vessels, you have the pulmonary circuit that goes to the lungs. And again, it does not look exactly like this. But it's just saying like blood is going to and from the lungs. And then you also have the systemic circuit. And what you have is blood going to and from the head and neck and upper body, and you also have blood going to and from the rest of the body. So this is the systemic circuit, this is the pulmonary circuit here. So again, it does not look like this weird sort of like angel-like thing here. Right? So okay, but it's not just about the anatomical structures, but what's inside the heart and also in the blood vessels. That is the blood as well. It is blood a tissue? So you might be thinking, hmm, and if you don't know what tissue is, go back to chapter 4 because that's all about tissues. But what are the basic components of a tissue? You have a cells, you have cells, you have extracellular proteins, and you have a, some sort of this thing called ground substance, which is the fluid component of what we call the matrix. So we have protein fibers plus the ground substance is a matrix or sometimes called extracellular matrix. So blood is a tissue, it's a connective tissue, but it's a kind of a, its own special exception, exemption. Or exception, not exemption, duh. Okay, all right, so then cells, we have extracellular protein fibers, and then we have a ground substance in blood. But the thing with blood is that it's a little different. This item number two with the connective tissue, so again, all connective tissues, they have cells, proteins, and ground substance in the matrix. But blood is a little different because instead of having protein fibers that are solid, it has extracellular proteins. So these proteins are water soluble instead of being solid fibers, like collagen. Now, so it's a ground substance, but this is, and to review what a matrix is, an extracellular matrix is basically part of connective tissue that isn't cells. So pretty much everything that's outside of the cells, that's why it's extracellular. Now, extracellular proteins plus a ground substance is a matrix, or sometimes called ECM, or extracellular matrix. So the analogy I like to use is like, it's like rebar, and then you have the cement, but in this case, in the terms of blood, it's not going to be solid rebar. Think of it like maybe like a flotilla of rafts or some sort of, some sort of like structure form, like floating around in the blood. So it has to be water soluble in blood, otherwise your blood wouldn't be liquid. You still have ground substance as well, and then that makes your matrix. So this would be a typical, this analogy works for typical connective tissues and like areolar tissues or dense connective tissues like tendons and ligaments, but for blood, it's a little different. So again, blood, these extracellular proteins that are water soluble, plus the ground substance make up something called plasma. Now plasma is the extracellular matrix of blood. So again, extracellular meaning outside, so everything that isn't the cells is our plasma, at least when we're talking about blood. Now, Cells of the blood are, have the special term called formed elements. So pretty much it's like these solid and they're far, surrounded by membrane and these are the formed elements. They're just a fancy name for the cells of blood. So what are the formed elements? Well, my favorite mnemonic I like to use is like, okay, what does the Red Cross logo look like? So the Red Cross logo looks like this. It looks like a Red Cross. But think of it this way. Okay, you have, like, you're a big fan of the Red Cross and you have like dinnerware and you have a plate that has a Red Cross logo on it. So this is my mnemonic, a Red Cross logo on a plate. And I, if, oh yeah, if you're in other countries, sometimes they have Red Crescent or Red Diamond, depending, I, they have different cultural sensitivities, depending on the different, the where the Red Cross is located. So they're sometimes called other things. But same thing, red, white, and thing, part of the mnemonic is on a plate. So we have red blood cells, like the red and the Red Cross, the white blood cells, like the white background, and why do I say, like, think of it like you're a big fan and you have your dinnerware with all the Red Cross logos on it? Because platelets, that's the third type of formed elements. And these are what they look like. So, the, these were, even though this is like an electron scan, scanning electron microscope image, looks like a super 
super high res image, even though it looks kind of grainy here, but compared to looking under a regular microscope, you can see details of these cells. Now, they are not going to have color using this technique, but red blood cells are these erythrocytes. So if you look under a regular microscope, they will appear red. And then leukocytes are white blood cells, and they're actually more of an off-white color, but relatively to the red, relative to the red blood cells, they look white. And then the platelets are thrombocytes. There are these little fragments of cells, and we'll get more to it in future lectures here. But look at them. They have different sizes, and notice that the platelets are really small compared to red and white blood cells. Sometimes just call it RBCs and WBCs, re re um, respectively. But also look at the texture. Like the red cell, blood cell has this little divot right here, which is pretty important. We'll get to that soon. And notice that the white blood cell it has all these ruffles, and these are little projections of this white blood cell here. And notice that this platelet is the small, relatively small compared to the red blood cells and white blood cells. All right, so what is blood? Well, we have now, what if you take just whole blood and then we do a process called centrifugation, you kind of separate it according to its solid and liquid components. Well, you notice that over here we have what we do, how we how do we do that? Well, if you being, or I don't know if the 50th state fair, like when they used to have it, like carnivals and fairs, you probably, if, hopefully you've tried this ride. If not, well, don't do it if you get easy motion sickness, but I think this ride is a lot of fun. But what do you do? You go inside and then this thing spins around really fast. And then this motion, this centrifugal, this is what we call, or well, let's see, centrifugal motion forces are fictitional. This isn't a physics class, but this is what's happening here. So these forces, the centripetal and centrifugal forces, are going to cause you to kind of stick to these walls because, again, due to your own mass, it's kind of going to allow you to stick to this, even though like gravity would ordinarily pull you down if it wasn't spinning. Thanks to those rotational forces, it's keeping you stuck toward moving toward the outside of this cylinder compared to just falling due to gravity. So that's what you do with the blood sample and that's how you can separate it into its solid and liquid components is by centrifuging it. So you do a very similar process, but you're doing it on a small scale. So you're taking a blood draw from somebody and then you place in a centrifuge. That's what basically that the gravitron is just a huge centrifuge and then what you do is like spin this blood sample around like this and let's look at the merry-go-round come on start there we go okay and then after you're done you collect it and this is going to make the heavier stuff sink towards the bottom because why the heavier stuff just like your body in that gravitron is going to go toward the outside of that spinning this tube right there and then the liquid part that's less dense is going to be pushed toward, or it's not going to follow, the, be pushed toward the outside as much. That's why it rises, or it rises relative to the top compared to the solid red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So all the formed elements will end up settling toward the bottom. And actually, if you let it settle over time, but it would take a long time, that's why they speed up by using a centrifuge to help separate it at a quicker pace. Now, if you look at the composition of whole blood, now you're separating into plasma, which is the liquid component, and then you have the formed elements, which are your red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Well, now that, or actually this is, looks like a big fibrin clot here. I should get a better picture of this. But plasma is the majority of your blood, and it's mostly water, 92%. But with the formed elements and all the cells and fragments of cells here, Notice that red blood cells make up 99.9%, .9%, so they are the vast majority of your form elements in your blood. So again, you do have red, white blood cells and platelets, and even though they're few in number, they're still very important, but the majority of the cells in your blood is, are red blood cells. Now let's talk about something called hematocrit. And hematocrit, so the open stacks definition is the number of red blood cells in your whole blood. So you take a whole blood sample, you centrifuge it, and then count the volume of red blood cells. And then you have to represent it as a percentage. That's the typical measurement of the hematocrit as a percentage. Now, the thing, the red blood cells over the total is also used by the CDC and WHO and pretty much almost other, everything but the Martini book. Like I'm trying to find the Martini version because Martini, the, if you're using that book, it says the number of formed elements in whole blood. And that is slightly different, but not too much in terms of the big picture, because again, why? 
Well, 99.9% .9 of your formed elements are red blood cells. So this is, it's not exactly the same, but the difference is so minuscule. And I've seen this previous definition more often. I have, I'm trying to find where Martini got this origin, this formed element and why they really tried to stick to that. But we are not going to use the Martini version. We are going to use an OpenStax definition, which is because I see that whenever I look up the literature on hematocrit, usually they say red blood cells over total. So we will use red blood cells over total definition for this class. But if you do the math, it's almost exactly the same. But if you want to get really specific, formed elements is not the exact same as red blood cells. Now, hematocrit, there, in the previous picture, we showed like, and I'm trying to find where OpenStax got its normal hematocrit ranges. I am going to use the National Institutes of Health's normal hematocrit ranges, or kind of use it as a basis. So based on their studies and their metadata, that the female average hematoc normal range of a hematocrit is around 36.1 to 44.3. And again, this is talking about young adult females, and we're not talking about changes in hematocrit over time. We're just talking about, like, say, for example, someone in their 20s and doesn't have any other underlying conditions. Male hematocrit, uh, average male hematocrit, the normal range is a little higher. So notice that instead of the lower bound being 36, now it's up to 40, and the upper bound is at 50 versus 44. Now for this class, do I want you to memorize these percentages to the nearest tenth? I am going to be an exact in this case, and I'm going to get, make it, I'll do a little rounding here. So I, what I want you to know is, normal female, female hematocrit is around 40 plus or minus 4%. And I think it is different, uh, maybe like off by 1%, and the range is a little big, bigger in the open stacks, but where are you going to use this values for these values for our class? So that's pretty easy, 40 plus or minus point, or pl plus or minus 4%. And normal male hematocrit, 45% plus or minus 5%. So that would be like 40 to 50. So that's kind of like rounded. If you round it off to the nearest whole percent, you kind of get the same values. Now, am I going to be mean to ask you, okay, this person has like 36 or has 35.9 hematocrit. Am I going to ask, are, are they anemic? I'm not going to do something like that. If I ask you about whether someone's hematocrit is out of the range, it will be pretty obvious. So hematocrit, the open stacks definition, this is the one we're going to use, the percent of red blood cell volume over whole blood. And we will get about to get talk, when we talk more about hormones, we'll talk about like why there is a sex difference between hematocrits in females versus males. And again, we're not using the martini version, we'll use the open stacks definition. So example for a hematocrit calculation, if a five male, you take a whole blood sample from someone, it's five mils total in that tube. You spin it down, centrifuge it, and then you notice that in that red pack part, that there's only two mils, and that that's the dense red packed cells. So what is the hematocrit of this? And you do have all the information here. So what you do is just take two mils red blood cells over five mils of that whole blood sample, and then convert to percentage. And what's the easy way to convert to percentage? Well, this would be 0.4% or not 0.4% in the terms of decimal it would be 0.4 multiply that by 100% so then you get 40% another way you can do is just multiply it you can get this to 100 so you can just get this to 100 by multiplying by 20 2 times 20 is 40 so this the this person's hematocrit would be 40% so kind of like on the low end for a male but totally normal for females so that's what how you were able how you're able to calculate the metagram. Now, plasma, now we're talking about the solid portion. We'll get back to the cells, but what about the fluid portion of, of, of our whole blood? Well, it's mostly water, but it's not all water. So there are other components to the fluid portion, the extra or the matrix of blood. So we also have electrolytes like sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, and other electrolytes and ions as well nutrients and organic waste because the your blood is not only important in delivering all the nutrients and oxygen and things your cells need to keep alive but it's also important in removing the byproducts that and the waste that would accumulate if you didn't have blood flow to an area there's also many different types of proteins and dissolved gases like oxygen carbon dioxide and even nitrogen does dissolve in blood too 
that makes sense. All right, so about water, and why is wa our water and electrolytes very important? Well, back to osmosis. So osmosis is, again, that movement of water across the plasma membrane. If this sounds foreign to you, go back to, I believe it's chapter three with cell transport. And osmosis is very important for this semester. So if you're not, if you need to improve your knowledge or you're not unsure about your knowledge of osmosis, by all means, go back to my previous videos, go back to chapter three because it will really pay off this semester. Okay, so here we have a normal water balance and homeostasis. Again, it's all due to not just the amount of water, but also the amount of electrolytes on the outside of the cell and the extracellular fluid, but also the amount of electrolytes and solutes on the inside of the cell are intracellular. Now, if you have too much water and it's too dilute on the outside, what will happen is that you'll have or what we call a hypotonic solution. If there's, you'll have more water flowing into the cell, and this could eventually cause them to swell and rupture. But if there's too little, if it's very concentrated on the outside, the high concentration of solutes, whether it's salts, sugars, or proteins, they will draw out water from cells and suck out the water from the cells, causing them to shrivel and what we call crenation. So that's why it's very important for plasma to have an appropriate water and electrolyte balance because it could dehydrate cells or cause them to overhydrate and swell and eventually what we call lysis, burst and rupture. And this is why it's important for plasma to have the maintain its appropriate solute concentrations and water balance. And that's why it's very important if you're going to nursing or medicine to, to use the right osmolarity so you're not doing applying these stresses to the cells in your blood, especially those red blood cells, because you don't want them to pop. But you also don't want them shriveling up, or you also don't want the uh, very hypertonic plasma to draw out water from your tissues, uh, surrounding tissues as well. Okay, so nutrients. Why are the nutrients? Well, remember like when we talked all the way at the beginning of last semester about the macromolecules, and this includes our macros. And what are our macros? Well, you know about carbohydrates, lipids, amino acids. So you're going to have like carbohydrates such as glucose. That's all we, glucose abound in blood. Fats will cover later on the semester when we talk about fat transport. It's so its own special category. It doesn't free flow. I mean, there is a tiny amount of fats that can float in the in your blood. But again, remember fats aren't wa really water soluble. So you can't have a high concentration of fats floating around in your blood. Amino acids, these can float around in your blood. And then you also have minerals and vitamins. So it's important to deliver this so that you can keep your cells and tissues alive. Now carbohydrates and let's see, okay, man, but we'll get to, to more of that later. All right, so what are other ways? Well, Carbon dioxide, a byproduct of aerobic respiration, all the way back to basic biology. And, but we'll get more to that when we talk about metabolism and the respiratory system. But there's also organic waste as well. So when your body is consuming nutrients, do these nutrients just end up as pure energy? Well, some of it gets cut, the chemical bonds can get converted to energy. But in terms of the atoms itself, something has to happen to them. So when they're used up, you have to get rid of it somehow. So what's one major types of organic waste? Nitrogenous waste are a major category of them. And now I don't want you to know, memorize these structures, but I'm just wanting to show you the commonality. Here's urea, uric acid, and that can cause gout if there's too much of that. Creatinine, which is not the same as creatine. So creatine phosphate and creatine, those are the things that can be used to make additional ATP, but creatinine is the metabolite and byproduct of that. I also have bilirubin and ammonia. Now, again, whenever I show these organic co compounds, like, do I want you to know the exact structure? No, but what you should take away from this is what atom do they have in common? Notice that a lot of them have these, and this is why I use that blue, because we have all these nitrogen atoms. So these are our nitrogenous waste because these are waste byproducts that your body no longer needs, but they contain a lot of nitrogen. So this is why it's important to get rid of them because they can alter the metabolism and if they build up, they can harm cells or cause them to die as well. Now, proteins. There are many types of proteins. Now, albumins make up the majority of the blood proteins, not the vast majority, but around 55%. 
Now they also have globulins, and globulins also have subcategories as well, which we'll get through soon. Fibrinogen, we'll cover more when we talk about clotting, and there's other proteins as well that make up less than 1% of the mass of the total proteins in plasma, but they're still important. Like things like our hormones, our clotting factors, cytokines, chemokines, these are have very powerful effects because they do trigger receptors and all these hormonal changes or like immune system effects as well. But we're not going to, or not, or I'm just saying that even though in terms of their overall weight and percentage, they're very small, they still have very powerful effects. So even though they're far from the majority of the mass, it's still important to have these proteins around. Now let's talk about albumins that make up the majority of our blood proteins. Now serum albumins, they maintain something we call an oncotic pressure in blood. And it's good to know this now because this will come up in exam two when we talk more about blood pressure. But for now, we're talking just about the components of blood itself. So serum albumins are a type of water-soluble protein. And this is it's related to osmotic pressure. So oncotic pressure, you can think of it as osmosis, but instead of due to things like sodium chloride or glucose or some other polar molecule, it's due to proteins. So proteins, just like salts and sugars, they can also att be attracted to water or and vice versa and they can also draw out water as well so if you've did i mean we did had to do this online for the past two years or so but if you've done this like an ap bio what happens if you take a very salty solution and put it in this membrane over here and put in pure water well all the salt in that solution is going to draw water into the toward the side that has more solute therefore this is why these bags look very swollen now, what does that mean in terms of like osmotic pressure and oncotic pressure? So we have two fluid compartments and they're separated by a semi-permeable membrane that doesn't allow large things to filter through, but it allows water to go through. So one example, this is our blood and our interstitial fluid in our tissues. Now there are little things that there's membrane cells and membrane barriers between the blood and surrounding tissues, but there's water in blood and there's water in interstitial fluid. But blood has more of the has these serum albumins. So all of this high concentration of serum albumins, these are going to draw water toward them. But interstitial fluid compared to blood doesn't really have a high protein concentration. So they have similar electrolyte compositions, but if you have blood with more of these serum albumins, you're going to have an increased attraction of water toward these serum albumins. So again, interstitial fluid has some protein, but not as much as blood. So therefore, the water is going to be attracted more to blood if we're just looking at the serum albumins itself. So serum albumins are very important in blood in giving blood an ability to hold onto water, because if it didn't have these serum albumins, you have less attraction of the water toward the blood and the matrix of blood and plasma and you would start to lose water from blood because you don't have that oncotic pressure, which is, again, that attraction due to proteins. Again, it's not just proteins, but we're just, for the sake of that, just looking at proteins in that example. Now, why is that important? Well, what makes these serum albumins? And again, I always bring this up that the liver is the underappreciated organ the, in this whole, or just like in general, A&P, and this, also in your textbook. But your liver is an important organ then that it produces many of these serum proteins, including albumins. Now, here we have our blood and tissues. Again, blood has a general higher concentration of proteins due to the serum albumins. But, and this allows blood to hold onto water. But what if your liver ends up being sick or starts to fail or can't produce enough of these albumins? Things that if your liver becomes unhealthy, it can no longer perform its normal functions. So producing albumins is one of the normal functions of your liver. So if your liver ends up with liver dysfunction, it's going to lose the, it's going to produce less albumins. And then with less protein content in your blood, then it's not going to have that oncotic pressure that allows it to really hold on to a lot of water. So where does this water end up? It's going to end up where there's more protein and more oncotic and osmotic pressure. So if you have a drop in the amount of protein and drop in oncotic pressure, the water ends up in accumulating into in the tissue. So blood basically loses its ability to retain water. 
Now this is Ascites, and look at this. This person doesn't look. If you look at their torso and arms, they don't have too much adipose. So this isn't just having a really big beer belly. It's actually due to the accumulation of fluid in what we call the peritoneal space. We'll get to that maybe when we talk about the digestive organs, but this is what's happening. All this fluid, instead of being in the blood, now it's ending up in the surrounding tissues. When it ends up in the abdomen and this peritoneum, that's what we call ascites. So this person has like, probably has, and this is something we see often with things, liver diseases like cirrhosis or liver failure as well. And then edema is also, instead of being centrally located like this, when we talk about something called peripheral edema, Sometimes you can have that fluid accumulating in surrounding tissues or like things like your arms or especially due to gravity, legs are a common sight. Like my dad went in for a physical exam. He's like, this doctor was doing something where he's like pressing my leg like this. And I'm like, and, he, and I was like, oh, was he kind of pressing like this and he, along your feet and up your shin? I was like, yeah, that's what he was doing. I thought he was doing something like things, some, like feeling me up. And I'm like, no, 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 that he's checking for edema. But this is more specifically pitting edema because what happens is that they pressed into this person's foot but it's so waterlogged that these pits, these little indentations, take a while to disappear. Like most of us, we don't have a... I mean, we have some hydration in our tissues, but we don't have this much like we see in this example over here. So what, what there's a lot of the t surrounding tissues in these areas, like, and look at this, like, the dorsum of the foot. That is not normal. This is due to just the swelling of these tissues. So this is due to it be kind of squishy and waterlogged. That's why these indentations last there. So this is why it's, and this is classically seen in liver failure as well. Now globulins is another category of serum proteins. And yeah, the beast on your foot, it looks, yeah, so it's a different type it does involve fluid, but that's more like a allergic reaction and an possible anaphylaxis when you're talking about like a bee sting versus like like the bee isn't going to cause liver failure like that. That's more like a what you saw in the previous picture is more of like a long term accumulation of fluids due to long term liver failure. But yeah, it, but bee stings do cause changes in fluid balance, and that's why your foot swell up. That inflammation definitely causes the blood vessels to be leaky, but that, that's for like maybe unit two. All right, so back to globulins. So these aren't the same as your albumins. And what you might be like, what's the difference between albumins, globulins, and all these things? Well, they're all proteins and they are separated. So this is something called electrophoresis. If you're going to molecular and cell biology, you might do this in lab or in research. But do I want you to know everything regarding electrophoresis? Not really, but this is what separates them. So what happens is that they try to, try to separate these proteins based on whether they're big or small or whether they have more positive charge or more negative charges on the protein structure. So this is how they're able to separate things like albumins. And all of these things here, these are collectively called globulins. And notice that there are several types. There's alpha-1, alpha-2, beta, and gamma globulins. Do I want you to know all of the different types of globulins? No, but I'm just going to cover general categories. So these collectively are globulins, and alpha globulins include proteins like thyroxine binding globulin and cortisol binding globulin. So remember that thyroxine is that one form of thyroid hormone, right? And thyroid hormone is generally hydrophobic. So this is how you're able to transport, one ma major way that your body is able to transport the, um, thyroid hormone is by using a globulin that's mostly soluble in water and sticking a hydrophobic hormone like thyroxine on that. Cortisol is also hydrophobic. So cortisol binding globulin is a, also water soluble itself. But if you can stick cortisol onto this globulin, cortisol has an easier time being transported in your water, your, in the water soluble or the water-based plasma of your blood. And geotensinogen, we'll cover that more when we talk about blood pressure. There are beta globulins, including sex hormone binding, binding globulins, so things like your androgens and estrogens, they're going to bind and piggyback on this. So sometimes the different globulins actually bind different hormones. And there's transferrin, which carries iron, and then plasmin, we'll cover more maybe when we, t when we talk about clotting. And then also gamma globulins. So what we have here is that gamma globulins include something called antibodies, 
or immunoglobulins. But what, are they, what I'm getting at here is that globulins are a very diverse family and do I want you to know every single type of globulin out there? Not reasonable. I don't think that's even reasonable at the PhD level. Like medicines, they have to go, go maybe do that. But yeah, this is like globulins are a big, diverse category of proteins. Yeah, immunoglobulins, you probably heard a lot of this antibodies, especially in our current panini. This, like, this is very important in our immune defenses as well. Now, steroid and thyroid hormones are hydrophobic. And you might be like, okay, 9% to 2% of your blood plasma is water. So what happens to hydrophobic compounds in water? They end up separating, right? So this is why these globulins are very important. Is that if you have excess lipids and blood, what they can do is like they can form something called fat emboli. I mean, it's more when you have broke break your bones that happens. But things that lipids, they don't like dissolving in water and they tend to aggregate because they're repelled by water. So what prevents your hormones that aren't water soluble from aggregating and clumping like this? Well, what ha prevents them is that, again, what happens when you mix hydrophobic compounds with water? They separate. But when we make a salad dressing, how do we make sure that it stay prevents from separating as quickly? And how do we kind of make it disperse the oils in, in the water? We add a protein or emulsifier similar concept with these hydrophobic hormones and our water-based plasma. So why don't they do this? Because of these alpha and beta globulins. So to visualize this, for example, we have a sample estrogen like estradiol. And then estrogens, again, are steroid hormones. They're from cholesterol. They're lipids. Therefore, they're generally hydrophobic. But estrogens are hydrophobic. So what prevents them from clumping like this? Let's add an emulsifier. Let's add a protein. So their sex hormone binding globulin is not exclusive to estrogens, but what it's able to do is like this sex hormone binding globulin is water soluble itself. But what it also has is a special pocket that's attractive to that hydrophobic hormone. So hydrophobic hormones such as estrogens and androgens can bind to this hydrophobic pocket, but the overall globulin itself is water soluble so pretty much like a typically hydrophobic and not very water soluble compound like estrogens is able to piggyback and float around in the your blood plasma because it's bound to a water soluble protein like globulin so that's what it pretty much does there are some you can have free what we call free like in terms of like free, like especially when we talk about testosterone or estradiol free estrogens and free thyroid hormone, free testosterone, where it's not bound to one of these globulins. But the vast majority are bound to this because again, hydrophobic compounds have a hard time dissolving in water. But most of these hydrophobic hormones, they're bound to some sort of globulin and that's the major form of transport throughout your body. All right, so uh, we'll probably run over time. So I'm just going to try to bust through the rest of these lectures if you gotta go again we did have a late start thanks to my stupid software which i'm i'm definitely going to work on uh, after this but okay so blood functions so many different functions and we'll cover over them very briefly protective abilities of blood well one thing is that it's very important in circulating cells that are an important part of your immune system but also those globulins especially those antibodies that are very important for immune cell your immune system function so immunoglobulins, antibodies, what are, this is the overall structure and cartoon of an antibody. And an antigen is part of some, it's basically a group of molecules that your antibody is able to bind to and recognize and attach to. So an antigen itself might not be a complete pathogen, but it might be part of a pathogen. So antibodies are used exclusively. So kind of like the ammunition of your immune system, they kind of like, are there to attack and label these invaders and pathogens that could be causing disease in your body, but they're also used for your by your body to recognize pathogens as well. So pathogens by I mean things that can cause diseases and foreign substances as well. Sometimes it's not necessarily something that would cause a disease, but in like things like organ transplants, your body recognizes like, hey, this doesn't come from my body. Let's get rid of it. So immunoglobulins and all these like <coughs> are also important in just for your immune system to recognize foreign substances and eliminate it from your body. 
So we'll talk more about this when we talk about blood typing. Now, thermal regulation of the body with, like, what do I mean by that? Well, maintaining temperature homeostasis, maintaining a normal range of body temperature in your body. So what can do is cool or warm internal organs, and why? Well, remember that blood plasma is the liquid component of your blood, and plasma is 92% water. And water is, one of the properties of water is that it's able to retain heat. So what happens is that by blood being able to absorb and retain heat, this can cause your, this is how your body is able to kind of move blood around throughout your body to maintain the temperature homeostasis. So what happens when you're in a really cold environment? And what happens if you look at your fingertips or your extremities? Like if you're like me, like I, uh, when you go to like a, like going snowboarding in Worcester or, or Colorado or Park City, oh, what happens is that you'll see that your extremities start to get blanched. And why is that? Well, these have blood vessels, right? And a healthy supply of blood, but this finger is starting to lose blood. And why is it losing blood? Well, blood again has water, water has heat. But if it's at the surface here in extremities, you could be losing that heat to your environment. So this is why in cold environments, you typically have blood going toward your central areas because is it worse if you lose a finger versus if you lose your heart or liver? So it's more, yeah, it's more vital for you to keep your vital organs closer to the central that's more proximal and central to your body versus something that's more peripheral like your fingers. But yeah, if it goes on for long enough, you're going to not have this, the heat, you're not going to have the oxygen and nutrients. This is why frostbite could result in the loss of these peripheral tissues and digits. Why? Because again, it's more important to keep your internal organs warm and supplied versus like losing heat to the outside. So this is why your skin loses color. But also, what about the opposite end? What if you're overheating? And this is why some people flush because what's happening is, and this isn't an exact op. I was trying to find a good example of somebody flushing in a hot climate. This is more Asian glow, but similar principle. What's happening is that blood, more blood is going toward the superficial areas of the skin. And this is why people who get Asian glow or you see, yeah, the Asian flush reaction like me. This is why we turn red when we get alcohol. It's due to the blood appearing closer to the surface of our skin. Earth, and this is another example too, so what's happening with the skin super red, but why do people flush and have sometimes have this heat reaction in hot climates? Well, it's due to blood, again, having a plasma and water. So if you're just the opposite of bringing things closer, if you have a high temperature, maybe you want to actually bring blood closer to the surface so that you can have heat being lost and radiating out from closer to the surface and from the blood so you're cooling off your body. So this is why if you, if you notice you get super red when you're in a hot environment, like say here when it gets warmer, this is why your body's trying to cool itself off. I mean, we sweat, but blood and also putting things to our periphery is also a very important mechanism in keeping our body up, or maintaining normal body temperature as well. Yeah. And this is why, and if you also notice, well, we didn't talk too much, of, we didn't, we're going to talk about the urinary system later on, but the thing is that when you also bring, if in cold environments, when, if you've gone to cold environments and you're like, man, I have to use the restroom a lot. Well, if you're bringing all the blood closer toward your torso and central abdomen and your trunk over here, well, your kidneys are also located there as well. So you have more blood going toward your vital organs, including your kidneys. So that's why typically, like, it's very common for urine output to increase when you're in cold environment because you have more blood going toward your central organs, including your kidneys. All right, so buffering we'll talk more about later on in the semester, but one thing is that's very important in neutralizing acids, but also maintaining this normal narrow pH range of your blood. So you're, it's not 7.3 to 7.4, it's 7.35 to 7.45, so that point 0 0.05 is very important. It's not 0.5 different range, it's a 0 0.05 range. But blood is a buffer and what it does is convert carbon dioxide to this compound called carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is a weak acid, meaning that if you throw it into water, not all of the protons are going to pop off of carbonic acid. And that so you're going to have a mixture of car 
of this carbonic acid and bicarbonate. So not all of the hy hydrogen ions are going to pop off like in, for example, like a strong acid would be hydrochloric acid, where you have complete separation of like hydrogen and chloride if you don't have like, if it's not super saturated. But weak acid means that some of it is still hanging on there. Now a buffer solution, and if you're all the way back to basic chemistry, is that you have a weak acid and its conjugate base. So what we have here is basically carbonic acid, and this is carbonic acid minus that proton, minus the H plus. So if you add this plus H plus, you get the weak acid. So all the difference between this is just a proton. And then you need that water based solution. So the great thing about this is that if you have a buffer solution, if you add, have too much protons, then you can have this conjugate base neutralizing it. If you don't have enough protons, then this weak acid can donate protons back into the solution. So this is what we call the bicarbonate buffer system. We will cover this definitely when we talk about the respiratory system and metabolism. But this is the equation a preview of things to come. And transportability. So transport, blood is also, and blood, so think of it this way, blood is like your, and your blood vessels are like your body's highway system. They're the way of things, transporting nutrients, transporting gases, transporting everything your cells need to live, but also getting rid of the things your cells don't need and all of its waste. So it's just not just nutrients and waste. <coughs> and yeah, so what we have here is like, think of it this way, like highways, we have things like our food supply trucks, our delivery trucks, they deliver food, but we also have our garbage trucks that get, take away waste as well. So what we have here is that hormones, and not only is it just nutrients and waste, but also signaling molecules such as hormones or cytokines or chemokines. Remember your endocrine system was the main transporter of hormones, blood. So it's not only just like a road system, but it's not kind of like your, our mail system, if you're using, still using like if you still like writing letters or having paying bills. So it is a messaging system as well. And then gases such as our carbon dioxide, oxygen, and many, many, many of these cells are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So I think of this way. So there are many different vehicles on our roads and many different purposes for these vehicles, many different passengers, or passengers and cargo. Same with our blood and all the cells and everything else that floats in our blood. Many things are carried through our blood, blood system so that we're able to transport things through our body efficiently. And let's see, formed elements. So again, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So I'm going to talk about red blood cells. And again, I will run over time because I started late, but I'll try to try to cover red blood cells so that we have more time to cover this next time. Thank goodness I'll be going back into the office on Friday because yeah, that was kind of annoying. All right, so back to this. So this is what we call a blood smear. So what they did is take a blood or a whole blood sample. They put a microscope slide and they're looking at a microscope. So again, notice that it's not as detailed as that electron microscope image we saw earlier in grayscale. But what do we see is that most of you see these brown circles and they kind of look like little donuts with like a pale circle in the middle. And these are, if you look even closer, notice that they kind of look like this. And maybe there's some spherocytosis here, but we notice that these are our red blood cells. And when you use this type of stains, there are many di different types of stains, but red blood cells using this type of like histological stain, they look kind of pinkish, reddish. And these are white blood cells. Now, do they naturally look these vivid pinks and purples? No, it's due to adding certain dyes to make them easier to look under my microscope because they would look more pale, off-white, and very translucent. And over here, we actually see these little flecks here. These are our platelets. So again, driving home the point that platelets compared to red blood cells and white blood cells we see here, they're very, very tiny compared to those. So at red source sites, these red blood cells we see packed here, and I'm pretty sure this is a fibrin clot. But yeah, what we have here is that red blood cells make up again 99.9% .9 of the formed elements in your body or in the blood. So these are five, five far the most common blood cell type and that's why if you look at this stain right here you see that in this field you see some white blood cells maybe occasional platelets but the vast majority of these cells are these red blood cells over here now these red blood cells if you look in this is artificially colored it is using the scanning electron microscope and it does say it's colorized but notice that they have this round kind of dimple look 
Now it's not a complete hole all the way through, but it, it does have like it's like if you took a little like a little pancake or mochi and kind of squished it and pinched it like that, that's kind of like the shell shape of a red blood cell. So this chart shape is more specifically called biconcave, and you might be like, "Oh, well, remember like get back up when we talked about eye with concave versus convex." Well, if it was convex, it would be bulging out like this, but Instead of bulging outwards, red blood cells are by bulging inwards, so they are kind of caving in. So because they're caving in toward themselves, they are biconcave because again, bi means two, so bi means that it's concave in one end, but also concave in another surface as well. That's why they're bi biconcave, they're kind of like pinched like that. Now why are red blood cells red? Well, why? what color is Mars? Why is it called the red planet? What color is rust? Why is it we say rust red? What color is raw beef? Why is it red? And what do they all have in common? Well, they have uh, chemical compounds and components that have a lot of iron. So things like iron oxide and heme and myoglobin, they have iron in their chemical structure and this is central to red blood cells and why they are also red. So. This is due to this compound called heme right here, and right smack dab in the middle, we have an iron ion. So this gives heme its red color. Or actually, it's kind of funny because like now that we have all these plant-based burgers and plant-based like Impossible or Beyond Burgers that have this kind of red color, they use this pigment heme right here. But they get their heme from plant sources, so that's why even though we also find heme in our red blood cells, due to the heme being cut, I think most like. What do they use, like beets or something like that, or some sort of other, other comp plant compounds? That's how they give it that artificial red color. Yeah, so Iron Man is also, yeah, Iron Man is red, so yeah, iron is red. Yeah, he's red and yellow, but he's like, red. we're talking about iron, we're talking about red. That's great. Yeah, so especially like our clay rich soils, yeah, so like a lot of our volcanic soils, they're, I have to look actually look up more on that. Like, are, is our soil iron rich? I'll have to look that one up. But <coughs> heme is an important part of this big protein we call hemoglobin. So again, heme is not the same as hemoglobin, but it's an important component. So with each hemoglobin molecule, there are actually four polypeptide chains. So it's not what made in one crack with just one protein synthesis and one polypeptide. You actually need four po different polypeptides, and each of these four polypeptide chains fits a little heme molecule in it. So this is why when you have a complete hemoglobin molecule, kill, you actually have four heme, heme molecules with that. So this is why hemoglobin is red, and because hemoglobin is red due to the heme, which is red due to the iron, so red iron makes red heme, red heme means red hemoglobin, and red hemoglobin makes a red blood cell. I mean, there are other proteins as well, but that's the major component that makes it red. Now hemoglobin is very important because this is very important for transporting oxygen and we'll talk a lot more about this when we talk about the cardiovascular and our, the, the respiratory system as well. So there are four oxygen molecules. Why? Because each heme molecule can bind to one molecule of oxygen gas. But there are, per individual red blood cells, yeah, there are 250 million of these molecules in a red blood cell. And in a typical adult, we have 20 to 30 trillion red blood cells. So basically, this is a huge oxygen carrying capacity. So in other words, the ability to carry oxygen. How many potential oxygen molecules can you carry in your body? Well, you just take 4 times 250 times 20 to 30 trillion. So that is a huge amount, right? So, so what about... But, so, but if you also like in the previous picture, like, okay, why are red blood cells biconcave? Why don't they look like those that big white fuzzy ball like we saw with the red blood cells? Well, they can be, and this is what we call a condition we call spherocytosis. That's typically hereditary, meaning that you inherit it from one of your parents or both. And this person has an actually mix here. So these don't have that white hot, that white lighter area because they don't have that biconcave part. So because this part right here is thin in these normal shaped blood, red blood cells, that's why it kind of looks like there's a little hole. But it's actually just shining through because it's so thin. But notice that these sphere, round, ball-like red blood cells, 
they do not have that in the inner light area because they're completely round and therefore if you look at the round ball in the center of it, that's going to be the thickest part. Now, why aren't red blood cells round in most people? And you might think, wait, if it's a ball-like red blood cell, instead of being flat like a pancake and being like this, wouldn't it hold more hemoglobin and have more protein? And yes, it could be like that. But what's the difference between these? Well, what if we take a cross-section of this? So if we look at cross-section of a biconcave versus spherical red blood cell, well, what's the maximum distance that an uh, oxygen molecule needs to get to the center of a red blood cell? Well, think of it as like, they'll have more volume, they'll have more hemoglobin, but in terms of like a biconcave red blood cells, in terms of going from the surface all the way to the deepest part of a red biconcave red blood cell, this is the maximum distance it has to travel. Or if it's down here, it has even a shorter distance to travel toward the inner parts of the red blood cell. But and if you're talking about things that are very central to a spherical red blood cell, well, it's going to have a hard time and the parts that are central to this red blood cell, diffusion is going to be slower because it just takes more distance and time to get to that area. But the other thing too is that biconcave or spherical, it also refers to like the osmosis we talked about earlier. Like remember like if you put a cell in like almost very dilute hypotonic solution, it swells up, and if it swells up too much, it starts to burst. Well, that's the other thing about these spherical cells. They're already kind of swollen, so they're more prone to bursting due to hypotonic solutions, and they're also more fragile overall. So these biconcave, because they're thinner and not as thick, they're kind of like a water balloon that's not fully in, like filled completely with water versus one that's totally swollen with water. Like a swollen water balloon is going to be more fragile versus one that's kind of floppy. So red blood cells that are biconcave are more flexible. And they're a little more resistant to stress, mechanical stresses as well. So another analogy I like to use is like, okay, which type of schedule would you like to be? Like assume this is fall 2022 and we have some control or like some numbers down and we're back in person fully. Well. Would you rather have a class schedule where you are located along this strip right here with the mall and you just have to go from here to here to here to here to here just to get to and from your classes? Or would you rather have a schedule that's going from upper and lower campus where you're bouncing from the athletic buildings to the art and then you're going all the way to Hawaiian Studies and then you're going to Altawi Bizad and then you're going all the way back between these different like parts of campus? Which schedule is going to take more time? Which requires more distance and time to tra for transport? So this is why uh, having that biconcave shape is pretty advantageous because you have faster diffusion across a thinner cross section compared to something that has a huge cross section. But again, it also deals with factors such as fragility and prone to lysis. Okay, and I think this is, and, and this part I'll leave for next 